All right, welcome everybody to the November 2nd Hyperledger Technical Oversight Committee call. Um, two things that we have to be aware of and abide by on this call. The first is the antitrust policy. Uh, so this is a um, policy that basically says there are a number of people on this call from different organizations and we must be aware of and not participate in any activities that are prohibited under any of the antitrust and competition laws across the world. The second thing that we have to abide by on the call is our code of conduct, um, which is linked specifically in the agenda. Um, basically it says be respectful of others on the call, their ideas and opinions, and uh, everything should be fine. For announcements today, we have the standard Dev Weekly developer newsletter that goes out each Friday to hundreds of developers. If you do have anything that you would like to include in that newsletter, uh, please do uh, leave a comment on the link that's in the agenda. The second announcement is that on Thursday, November 16th, uh, we do have a workshop that is atomic cross-ledger transactions between Hyperledger Basu and quarter ledgers using Hyperledger Cacti version two. And if you are interested in attending that workshop, please do click on the link in the agenda and register for that event. Uh, a third announcement that is not on here, but it's probably something that is worth mentioning is that the uh, voting period for the Hyperledger Technical Oversight Committee for 2024 has kicked off. Uh, so if you have received a ballot, please do cast your vote. Uh, we have until I think November 14th to do that. Um, so that would be a Tuesday. And uh, you know, have a have a look at the candidates that are linked in the uh, GitHub uh, repo, the governance repo, to uh, see what their um, what each of the candidates is all about. Other announcements that anybody would like to make today? No, okay. So we do have the Hyperledger Sawtooth report that is out there. Uh, we do not have enough votes on that, uh, at least not as of yesterday when I, the other day when I put this together. Um, so please, if you haven't yet taken a look at this, please do take a look at it and add your um, comments and feedback and potentially approval to that report if you think it looks good. Any uh, any questions though on the Sawtooth report for those of us who've had a chance to review it? No, okay. So we do have four reports that are due next week uh, on the 9th. They are the Anoncreds, Aries, Indy, and the Roja reports. So if you are responsible for those, please do, um, have a look at putting those together. I do know I've seen, at least in the chat, uh, that Stephen is working on um, the first three. And it looks like Victor has got a thumbs up there for the Aroha one. So I uh, will look to see those coming in next week. All right, so for discussion items today, uh, there's two items on the agenda. The first is to talk about any actionable items for the TOC from the San Francisco Member Summit that anybody who attended might have heard. Uh, and the second one is to talk about our best practices for Automated Pipelines Task Force. Um, so this first item on the discussion list is uh, intended to just um, obviously not uh, talk about what anybody specifically said, but to uh, talk about things that you may have heard at the San Francisco Member Summit that you think is one worthwhile for the TOC to hear about. And then secondly, um, to see if there's anything that we think might be actionable uh, for the TOC to take as, a, as an action item moving forward. So I know a few of us were there. Um, maybe I'll open the floor uh, to see if anybody has any specific thoughts before I add mine. Okay, so let me let me add a couple things that I heard. 
um, and and then we can uh, maybe talk about if there's something that we think we can do about that or um, or not. So uh, one of the things uh, that I thought was a takeaway from the the conversations that I had is that there's still a question about how to contribute to the um, Hyperledger Foundation, right? So, um, you know, what is the what is the process? Are there, you know, different mechanisms? Obviously we've got labs and top level projects that can come in. Um, so there was a, um, you know, a couple of folks in the member summit who weren't necessarily aware of the different processes that we have. And so I thought, you know, there's a possibility for us to, to figure out if there's something that we can do uh, to potentially help that um, for new folks who are coming into the, the foundation. Uh, the second thing that I heard uh, surrounding that same thing is not only the how, but the, the why of it. And I, I know that um, David Boswell had given us a, a presentation uh, a few months back about kind of the why it's important to contribute to open source. Um, and I'm, I think, you know, potentially there's something that we could do around that particular item of bringing, bringing that discussion to a wider audience other than just the TOC, um, who obviously, uh, you know, added to that and knows kind of why it's important. So those uh, are two of the first things that I've heard um, that I thought were interesting from the, the Hyperledger Member Summit. Any thoughts on, on those items? Yeah, I'm really glad to hear that. I wasn't in that session that you mentioned because there were, just for the people who weren't there, there were some parallel sessions that were going on. So I missed that one that you were referring to, Tracy. But I'm glad to hear there is interest in why. I think, you know, it's easy to assume that maybe everybody kind of understands the why, but to have people say that, you know, they it would be helpful for them to understand more about that is is useful to hear and I and, you know as you say we've done some of that this year but it sounds like for next year we definitely need to do more so that, that that's helpful to hear yeah David I'm, I'm wondering you know is there mechanisms to get that presentation to a wider audience uh that you presented to us is there ways to um you know have we written a blog post up about this you know what are the what are the mechanisms I guess uh, for specific items that we could do as takeaways. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure there certainly are. I mean, I'd be curious to hear from people what what format it would be useful in. I mean, I think a lot of this is content that maybe it's helpful for people to take internally. Like, I, I'm happy to do another presentation. I'm happy to do a blog post, but I think it might be, and maybe I'm wrong about this, but my assumption is maybe it's information that somebody who's interested in getting their organization to contribute would take and have a conversation internally. So, and again, if that's the case, let me know what what's the right format. How would it be useful to empower those people? Like, what's the right way to structure, or what's the right way to you know, you know, give it to those people who want to have those internal conversations. Um, that's an assumption I'm making. Maybe that's true. Maybe it's not. That's why I'd be interested to hear from people here. Like, if it's useful for you to have that why conversation internally, what what sort of material would be helpful for you to have that conversation? Mm -hmm. Bobby? Um, thanks, Tracy. I'm, I find, like, from an educational perspective, and that was your first point, is how to, you know, get that information to the people who need it on how to contribute on the different levels. Um, and this is just something that I find um, when I'm community building is that if you have like say the first Wednesday of the month, uh, welcome to the community session and it's consistent on that first Wednesday, you'll find people who have questions will make that event. And then David's great presentation could be then, you know, whatever you wanna give them. But I find if there's a consistent time for people and they say, oh yeah, it's coming up, it's coming up. I'll, I'll, I'll make that rather than to reach out to David and say, David, I don't know how to contribute. Can you teach me? Um, that's just a thought. Yeah, thanks for that, Bobby. And, and David, I think to to your other point, um, I, I do know that it is important for there to be somebody internally to organizations that can help people through the process, right? Because then they don't feel like they have to continue to 
reach out to, you know, the Hyperledger staff or somebody in the Hyperledger community uh, with questions that they think are um, fairly basic, right? That they they uh, they should figure out. So I, I like your idea of, you know, is there a playbook or something that could be put together um, that would help these people um, start to have those conversations or to give it, I mean, part of the problem is, is if nobody knows about it in the organization, then it's hard to have that internal person. But if, if you do have an internal person that's been through the open source process before in other places, then it, it tends to be an easier sort of thing. And so, you know, there's, I think there's two different types of people or audiences that we have to account for in that thing, which is the, um, you know, maybe people who have been involved in open source and other projects and just need the, how is Hyperledger different or same? Um, and then there's the, I don't know anything about open source and what are the first steps that I should be taking as I um, try and figure out like, what do I need to do, right? Um, so I need to talk to the legal department. I need to get, you know, some sort of agreement from um, somebody, a sponsor, you know, things like that, that I think would be useful to, to obviously have. Um, and so, yeah, I guess having a, a thought through uh, the different sorts of folks that something might be useful for. That's a good point. I mean, we can't treat all organizations the same because they might be at different places, right? So what one, what may be helpful for one person in one organization might not be the right way to approach others. So, mm -hmm. I mean, I think that's all good feedback. And and yeah, again, if you have any, if anybody here on the call has specific suggestions or ideas, I'm certainly open to it, but this will be something. So we're going to take feedback from Member Summit and go into our staff planning call for 2024 next week. So yeah, any these sorts of conversations and ideas are going to be really helpful for us. So yeah, I will definitely bring up the we need to do more why uh, um, in that discussion about 2024. All right, Peter? I will put down a quick suggestion on what to put in the document. I think licensing would be one of the front and center things because if somebody is trying to advocate for this internally probably one of the first questions they will ask themselves is how how am i going to explain to our legal department what is going to happen and uh if they don't know the intricacies of the licensing if they aren't aware of all the reasons why we use Apache 2 then they may not be able to articulate that as well as it possibly could so the document could help them with uh, that specific thing for example yeah Peter I think that's a great example I, I remember having a conversation uh, with the, some lawyers about what was Apache 2 and what did it mean for our patents and things like that. So I think that's definitely a, a really, um, it's a conversation that will happen. Steven? Um, in the reaction to the government um, being on that contributions um, discussion was, was pretty good. Um, so perhaps two things. Um, one is, uh, a specific focus on the benefits of of open source, oh, you know, open by default for governments in general, um, but also trying to use. Uh, so that's one, and then the second would be um, uh, those with influence within governments um, uh, promoting open source by government um, as as an approach. So I think both of those. Um, methods could be useful in, in showing uh, particularly governments how to move forward in, in the open world. Yeah, I think that's, uh, it's something that uh, obviously BC government does very well. Um, and I'm sure a lot of folks could learn from, from what you guys are doing there. Um, you know, I do think that the open by default is, is a, extremely useful sort of idea and i think the you know very similar to to what you say right i think 
that sponsorship of um, having somebody who thinks that open source is important is important regardless of whether it's government or business. Um, and so, how, one, how do you find that sponsor? And two, um, you know, what would that sponsor need to be doing in order to make sure that open source is successful at a particular organization? Other thoughts on this topic or any other topics that uh, people who attended the San Francisco Member Summit may have taken away? I had a couple of other thoughts from a couple other sessions. Uh, um, there were two other sessions that I went to that I did think there were some interesting discussions that might be relevant for the TOC. One was the um, kind of the evolution of fabric. I, and I was really encouraged by that session. Of, so for the people who weren't there, it was it was a really nice mix. It wasn't only the existing fabric contributors and maintainers. There were some people who were new, relatively new to the community, new to fabric, who really wanted to step up and get involved. So I, I thought that was a really nice takeaway that, you know, we can get more people involved and there are people out there who do want to step up and take a leadership position. So two of the three facilitators, this was their first member summit, again, relatively new to the community. That was Sam from GoLedger and Svetans from Cinefi. Uh, so it was really great to see them wanting to really help take a leadership position. And then Dave Inert was there and he did a really great job of setting up the discussion. He did a mapping exercise. And so this is one of the points I wanted to reference. He, uh, um, you know, there's a lot going on in the community around fabric. It's not only fabric, you know, there's other projects, other, other labs that are related to it. And so he did a mapping exercise. He put all that together in one place and really showed, hey, these are the different pieces. Hey, here is how they fit. And that was really valuable. So that, you know, I, I think we still need to do some work about figuring out where that lives and then doing some promotions around that. But we heard from people there, hey, this was really valuable. I I thought it was really instructive that there were people who had been in the community for a while and didn't know about many of those things. They may have known about some of those things, but not all of them. And then we heard from people who were new to the community and it's like, hey, I started using Fabric and didn't know about any of these things because it wasn't really clear, right? You go to the Fabric project and you think that's all there is about Fabric, right? So we heard from people saying, I'd been using Fabric for months and I finally found out about this one lab and it was hugely beneficial for me, right? Like I cut down the amount of time that I had you know, to spend on doing a thing. So, you know, that mapping exercise was useful. And I heard from other people there, you know, the mapping for fabric has been done, but maybe the thing for the TOC is to consider, are there other places where we want to do that ecosystem mapping? Because I had one person in that session say, hey, this would be really useful for Bezu, right? And maybe it would be really useful to have a mapping of the identity ecosystem, or maybe, you know, maybe there's other ecosystems that would be useful to to map and and to provide you know for people so that that's one takeaway uh, it seemed to be a very useful thing to do for fabric maybe there's other things we the toc would want to do that same sort of thing for and then part two of that once you have that map you know i think some some things become more obvious so when dave did that mapping it was very clear that there were a few different efforts that were very similar to each other that we could you know try to make an attempt to drive some you know to facilitate some discussions and see if we could drive some collaboration very much like what happened around cacti and weaver and interoperability there was these two similar efforts so maybe you know we could do the same thing where we bring those together so that was one of the sessions and i can talk about another session too but i want to see if dave has anything to add to that but i do think that mapping exercise very very useful Maybe we want to do it for more projects. But Dave, did you have anything else to add on that fabric one? I think you covered it extremely well. <laughs> and I know Dave, you and I still have to like figure out where and all that lives so we can share that with right. the TOC maybe in a future call. Right. Yeah, that was my question. Um, <laughs> I, I wanted to see if we could get a, a preview of that, at least to um, you know, see what this mapping exercise looks like. Uh, I think maybe it would give people some ideas uh, for how that might work out in other areas. Um, yeah, Stephen's given a thumbs up. So uh, I think, you know, once you guys get that in a place yeah. that we can take a look at it, maybe we add that to a future uh, TOC call just to take a look at it or something like that. Yeah. 
Yeah, I don't know, Dave, if you want to, you know, we could maybe share that next week or something or, or, but yeah, I'll follow up with you over Discord and we can talk more about where it lives and everything. Sure. Yep. And again, I, you know, it's, I think it's up for this group to decide, but maybe again, there are maybe other places where that mapping exercise would be helpful. The other session I went to was called Reducing the Cost of Deployment. And there was a number of different discussions there. Uh, um, but there were two things that, again, I thought were relevant for this group. One was we heard from people say there's some gaps in the technology, like, hey, when I'm wanting to deploy something, you know, it would be really helpful to have this thing or this other thing. So, you know, they I've I've encouraged those facilitators to document that and maybe we can invite them to a future TOC call for them to share like exactly what they heard about what those missing gaps were. I don't want to, you know, kind of speak on their behalf, but I heard some people say that, hey, it would be helpful to have something around key management or, hey, it would be helpful to have something around zero knowledge proofs, you right? So what do those people who are trying to deploy things do in those cases when they feel like, hey, there's this missing piece? So I don't know if there's a kind of, again, to facilitate a discussion between them and the TOC, like how, what do we do with, when we hear that there's a gap, what do we do about that, right? So that's basically the high level that I thought maybe the TOC would work on. I know we did that project gap task force, but that's been a year and a half plus right now. Is that like an ongoing effort or do we need to do that on a repeating basis? Maybe every year, every two years, we need to kind of re-look re at gaps. So anyway, that was one takeaway. That I heard people say there were some technology gaps and it would be great if these other projects existed or other labs existed. And then- uh, David, on, the, on that particular one, I, you know, yes, we did do the project gaps, but I don't think we ever figured out how to fill those gaps. And yeah. I think that's <laughs> the step that needs to be taken. Sure. Right, is uh, once, sure. We, once we figure out what the gaps are, how do we figure out one, what exists out there today? Um, and is there something that we can go have a conversation with the, the folks who are maintaining that currently? Um, or are we already having conversations with those folks, right? I, I think, um, you know, there's a, in the Open Wallet Foundation, there is uh, what we're calling an OID for VC task force. And there's two things that they're kind of focusing on. One is educating people about, about what OID for VC is. And the second thing is to go out and actually do a survey of what's out there um, and um, really take a look at what's open source, what licenses they're using, um, what features do they have available? Because what they want to do from this task force is go out and reach out to the of people who are um, obviously maintaining these projects and see if they can bring those into the Open Wallet Foundation as a um, you know project, as a place where people can already have something that's available. Um, obviously, you know, if there's nothing that's available, then there's a question of, well, from the people who are involved in this task force, is there some project that they would like to start together? Um, I think that's, you know, for this particular task force, obviously it's not the case. There's a ton of things that are out there focused on this. Um, so I, I really think that we could do something that is, we we have a gap, we know about a gap, we somehow find out about that gap, and then we create some sort of task force that is specifically focused on getting the code into uh, the Hyperledger Foundation for that gap. Yeah. Um, be that either through something that already exists or through creation of a, a new lab slash project. Yeah, that's a great idea. Yeah, I mean, you're right, you're right. And I agree with you. It's not just enough to rerun that gaps task force because you're right, that it was missing that other piece. But yeah, the gaps task force plus that the piece you were just talking about from Open Wallet seems very powerful. Um, and again, if it's helpful for the TOC, I can invite those facilitators to come to the session and have them share more about what the gaps they were seeing. Uh, um, but But that was one takeaway. Um, and then the other one was, and I think Dave, you had a good point there. And uh, if I miss kind of quote you step in, but you were talking about how now that we have had people doing a lot of deployments in different spaces, it would be helpful to look at those common patterns in a given area and then see what we could do to kind of help people replicate or repeat those patterns. So in my mind, maybe that's documentation or a lab or, or a white paper or what have you. But like, you know, again, we've had a lot of supply chain deployments at this point. We've had a lot of, you know, different 
deployments at this point? Like, how do we, and I think you would reference grid as a good example. Like, is there a, a, a project or a resource that's like, hey, if you're doing a deployment on this thing, here's a thing you can use to help you get there quicker, right? So, uh, um, so again, I don't know if that's a task force or what, but maybe some sort of a pattern, uh, um, pattern creation or pa whatever we call it, pattern, you know, some sort of thing to help identify and help people kind of leverage all the work that's been done before, you know, around these different types of uses. Did that kind of capture your point or did, is that not quite what you were going for or? And that's a question for Dave in your... Dave, yeah, sorry. I think, I think that was it. Um... I'm still thinking about the fabric session. Sorry. Oh, no worries. No worries. But I did think you had a good point. I mean, we have, I mean, how do we help people leverage all the work that's been done in this space? So I do like the idea of that patterns, you know, patterns exercise. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, Peter? I was thinking about uh case studies in general just tying back to the answering the why question but what i was struggling with as i was thinking about it is that a lot of the things that would answer the question why are just really hard to measure or it's not something that people would be willing to publish but foregoing all that if there were members of the foundation who would be willing to participate in some sort of, oh well, yeah, we do have the podcast. So if, if the podcast could do with someone willing an interview about the why and how they benefited from it, that could also be part of the content that helps people advocate internally because then they have something to point to saying, uh, these are the benefits because these other companies, these other members of the foundation had done this and this, and that's how it had gotten better. But before we actually go there, we do have to figure out what those uh, measurable objectives would be, which is very hard, and I'm um, yet to come up with specific things for that because from my uh perspective it's all very subjective because what i could tell you personally is that well it increases developer productivity it increases developer morale because there's open source things versus uh, proprietary and uh, people are way more engaged internally with things that there's a chance they could contribute back to uh, things like that, but I couldn't, for example, touch it from the business side. Well, thanks, Peter. Stephen? Um, on a different topic, I heard in the Bezu um, session uh, conversation about the possibility of putting together a mechanism between the project and the foundation for um, collecting funding for a specific for purpose and then um, soliciting um, contributors. Um, so funding a an open source contribution for some specific goal. Um, this is something we've talked about in the communities I've been a part of for, for a while. Um, I'm hoping that is, um, it is moving forward and, and moving along, but I think that could be very helpful for for some communities. Um, so I don't know where where exactly that lies and and you know how real it is, but I'm certainly hoping it's real. Yeah, yeah, I was in that session too, and you're right. There was a lot of interest around that, so thanks for flagging that, Stephen. Yeah, and I, mine. I mean, I think Hart's the right person to answer that. He's been closest to it. He's unfortunately not on this particular call. He's got a he's conflict today. At another event but yeah i mean it is real and maybe we can have him share about that at, at a upcoming call yeah and i you know one of the things i 
found interesting about that base two session was the focus on enterprise, um, you know, enterprise requirements, gathering those requirements, and then developing the source for those requirements, right? Um, so, you know, I, I really think, obviously, you know, we do already have a number of people who are probably providing input and feedback and feature requests to, to our projects. Um, I just thought it was interesting that they were doing it in a special interest group as a mechanism to really drive, uh, you know, people who are interested in coming together and having those discussions and doing the prioritization, right, to, to help figure out what is the most important thing for the group of people who are involved in that special interest group. So, um, you know, I don't, I don't think there's any specific action item for the, the TOC on that one, but I do think that there is um, an interesting pattern that is, is forming there that potentially other projects could use within the Hyperledger Foundation. Yeah, I definitely think that pattern is very important. I mean, we've thought at a high level how to do it, but you know how you govern the the funding and and um, how decisions are made um, is pretty important in figuring that out. Making sure every uh, you know P's are crossed and I's are dotted. So um, you know it doesn't have to be perfect out of the gate, but but just to have that example out there and then. Um, solidify it would be super helpful, I think. Yeah, no, I agree with you, Stephen. The details matter. And I think, and again, I don't want to speak for heart, but I think that's where things are, like trying to just make sure the, the you know, we've reviewed this enough and have a confidence that this is the right setup. So just taking a little bit of time. Great. Anything else that anybody took away from the, the San Francisco member summit that would be useful for people that either hear about or things that we might um, want to take actions on? No. Nope. Okay, well, I think this is a, a really good discussion and I think we should, there are definitely some items here that we can think about moving forward, um, you know, taking some action on and uh, seeing how we can move this forward. So I guess with that, the next item on our agenda is the best practices for automated pipelines task force. Um, so Peter, this is uh, up to you to give us an update on, on where things are at and see if there's anything that you want the, the TOC to reflect on or respond to. Okay, I will put the uh forms link to the chat in a second so to catch up everyone or people peter, who missed it but peter do you want to drive do you want do you want to share your screen or do you want me to keep this page up oh yeah i if i could share it i'll be awesome thank you so to catch up people from last time we were working on a survey specifically about automation and i left it uh, open for comments and editing for everyone so by now i will say it have reached the final form and uh, if everyone's okay with it we could publish it to maintainers of uh, all the projects and then see how many responses we get and then what I was going with, it says disable share. Oh, there we go. Thank you. Yes. So I will put the link of this in the chat. And uh, from my perspective, it is ready to go. But uh, I did want to give everyone another chance to comment, request changes that we could do live right here, right now. And if not, then uh, then it's published time. So does anyone have any thoughts on that? With the default being that it's published time. 
Peter, can you can you remind us? Uh, we're sending these out to the maintainers. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the okay. plan is to first trust the maintainers, and then based on the answers you get there, we can decide if we want to reach out to every contributor or whoever we can access as well. Or if we just uh, stop with the maintainers, because it also depends on how difficult it will be to process the data, how many conclusions do we feel like we can draw from it. Maybe based on the answers, we'll determine that we would like to have more answers. Maybe we'll say, oh, this, this is enough. All right. Maroon? Um, just to... This one comment, can we convert some of these questions into from radio box into check boxes with multi-select options? Yes, mm -hmm. I can do that right now. Which one? So. Interested in questions related to projects. I ask uh, where we are asking which package um, repository do you use or which dependency tool do you use? There's possibility that the project teams maintain multiple, um, at, at least on the core blockchain side, there are like SDK projects where they deal with multiples of that. So you want check boxes. Okay. Yeah, I agree that makes sense. So the registries, the package manager, so check boxes. Do you prefer package registry? I mean, maybe even this could be. Maybe they have a short list of top three. Uh, maybe not. This is definitely a radio box. Yeah, this is, uh, yeah. Are these the ones that you were thinking about, Arun? Right. Um, the package registry, the uh, the one that you already changed. And then I think there was one more thing about preferred package registry. This one? Mm-hmm. Okay. Cool. If there's no other feedback, then we can publish this and then analyze the data. And the other thing that I was going to post again is the link to the wiki page, which is this one. And then if you click through to the drafts, and this is where we are at. So it's a checklist. And uh, this is still not ready yet. It's a work in progress, but I just wanted to highlight that we're very open to contributions and uh, that in the next couple of weeks, I will add some things to it that will make it a first draft or release candidate, so to speak. And then uh, we can think about publishing it. And then the question I had is, if, if it is already clear what time, which week, we will have the last TOC meeting of the year before the elections, or is there going to be a gap at all? Because I remember last year and usually in other years, there was some time when we were not having meetings because the election was ongoing. Yeah, so Peter, I think the, the intention for this year is to have 
a bit of an overlap um, based on the timing of, of what things are. Um, you know, it, it'd be obviously great to have anybody who ran for the TOC to attend these meetings um, and, you know, find out what the, the overall process is and that sort of thing. But I do think that, you know, we will have to figure out um, potentially, depending on what changes there are to the TOC handoff of existing task forces. So kind of an update to, to what's happening there. And, um, you know, obviously we do have, I think, a, a couple of meetings in December that we won't have just because of end of year holidays and things like that, that people might have. So um, there's like probably three weeks, um, depending on when the timing is of not having meetings, end of December, beginning of January. Gotcha. Okay. So with all that in mind, my plan is to have the draft ready for final review before we go into the holidays so that everyone can uh, spend their holidays reading the draft <laughs> and reviewing it. <laughs> and then uh, when we come back in January, uh, we can just hit publish. And then uh, other than that, I did not have much else for today. Okay. Any any questions or comments for Peter? My question is, do you want me to cancel the meetings on the 21st and 28th of December uh, today, or do you want to wait? Uh... I mean, you can cancel them whenever you want, right? I think those are definitely ones that we will not be having um, just based on the timing. Agreed. Yeah, feel, feel free to to cancel those. Um, I think we also have, I don't know if we've canceled the 23rd yet of November, which is uh, Thanksgiving in the US which means that a number of folks on the call won't actually be here. Um, so we should probably do that one as well. And then I guess similarly to that, maybe the, the 4th of January, my guess is that depending on what holidays people are taking, they may end up taking off that week as well, so. Okay, you should all be getting hundreds of meeting cancellation emails. <laughs> Thanks, Ryan. I appreciate that. All right, any other topics for today? Okay, if there's no other topics, then we will say that we are finished for today and we will talk again next week. Everybody have a great week. Thank you. Take care Thank all. you. Bye. Yes. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.